Making coffee for yourself is one of life's great pleasures, but if you're passionate about coffee, very easily you can get a reputation as being the weird coffee person. Now, when a group gathers and the group wants coffee, that responsibility can often fall to you. And so today we're going to cover making coffee for a group. How do we make the best coffee possible for a large group of people? It's not that easy, and so there are some tips and tricks and things to think about when trying to create the kind of coffee experience that you love and you are really passionate about. We're going to cover three different approaches to coffee brewing, including a kind of new category of coffee brewer that I think is particularly interesting. Anyway, let's get to it. So, who wants coffee? So we've escaped to the kitchen. It's now on me to make a coffee for a group. There's eight of us. That's a lot of coffees to make. And in this example, we're going to be doing espresso-based drinks. Maybe you have an espresso machine. You've got a reputation amongst your friends as being a little weird about coffee, and they have high expectations. They want you, at the end of dinner, to wow them with some great coffee. Now, the drinks list is pretty long. We've got to make uh, two flat whites, one decaf latte, two Americanos, one decaf espresso, and two regular espressos. And yes, it might offend some Italians, but we are going to let people order milk drinks after midday. If that's what they're like, we want to make them happy. And they might expect us to pour some fancy patterns, show off our skills. For this example, what I want to do is kind of walk through the thinking behind brewing all of these drinks. And what I'll actually do is while I'm talking, I'll come in and I'll make those drinks continuously and we'll film the whole thing, speed it up so you know what's going on. And I'll tell you the things that I'm thinking about. And first up, I'm thinking about prepping my doses, doing my kind of mise en place, making sure I've got everything I need to make sure that I can just get into brewing and creating drinks. Secondly, I want to think about my guests again. It's night time. I don't want to give them enormous doses of caffeine, even if they're having caffeinated coffee. That fact is in a couple of ways. Don't be using your naked porter filter. Break out the one with two spouts because we are going to be serving single espresso drinks wherever we can. People don't want enormous amounts of caffeine. They want the taste of delicious espresso not to be awake at four o'clock in the morning. We'll also think about that as we factor into the dose. It's a 16 gram dose, whereas usually I might use an 18 gram dose. I'm going to grind a little finer, just lower that dose down. Just, it's a little extra thing, but it's nice to think about. In terms of technique, I'm going to be using a simplified version of my usual espresso technique, something a little bit more practical to do over and over again as quickly as possible. If you want to know more about my espresso technique, there's a link in the description down below. Then we're going to think about the order in which we make those drinks. You want to send them out as the hottest, largest drinks first and get smaller and smaller and smaller. That way you have the most possible people sharing the experience of drinking coffee together. If you send an espresso out first and an Americano last, the first person will have finished their coffee 10 or 15 minutes before the last person. And that seems like a terrible shame. So just think about that. The order of the build is dictated by the experience of my guests sharing delicious coffee. One thing I will say in, in praise of espresso, it's a little bit fussy and it takes a little bit of time and it can be frustrating, but it does mean pulling a decaf shot is pretty easy. I would recommend portioning out your decaf, keeping it in the freezer, and as and when you need it, pull a portion out, grind it if you know the right grind setting, and you can just pull a single shot of decaf espresso and they can have a really delicious experience. And once all the drinks are done, I guess we can head back to the table. Ah, to be honest, that was exhausting. That took quite a long time to make a bunch of drinks for people, and it was not a very relaxing affair. Now, there are good sides to making espresso, espresso-based drinks. Uh, you know, you can make lots of different drinks, really cater to people's tastes, and make them something they'll really, really enjoy. And you can also show off your skills that you've built up over time. Making espresso is hard, and it's nice to show off that you can probably do better than most of the local cafes around you. That's all good. The downsides are that it is pretty antisocial. You are gone from the table for really quite a long time. And you know, that's just seven drinks. If that goes well, that's probably 15 minutes gone. If that goes badly and you're trying to dial in again or adjust something, you could be gone 20 minutes. And that, I'm not sure that's okay. Now with espresso, I, I have an issue particularly, and, and uh, it's an issue I would kind of call dinner party syndrome, where if you're cooking for a group of people, when it comes to eating the food you've prepared or drinking the coffee you've prepared, you'll often look for the flaws in it. You won't be enjoying it, enjoying the conversation. You'll be a little bit focused on, well, how is this? Did I nail it? Is it perfect? Is it what I wanted to do? Uh, and that's a shame because you're really not present with everyone. And the whole point of being here is to be present with people. And I think there's a solution to that. And I'll tell you about it during a short ad for this video's sponsor, which is Headspace. 
You know, I worry that if I start by telling you the benefits of mindfulness that you might improve your focus or uh, maybe reduce stress or maybe sleep better, then I'm telling you things you already know. A lot of us want a mindfulness practice in our lives for a bunch of different reasons. For me, I've struggled with having a noisy, chaotic mind that really struggles to focus and be present and to pay attention. And meditation has been hugely helpful for me at working with that and improving that. Where I've struggled over the years was building that habit, making it a daily thing, and really that's when you see the rewards. And Headspace for me has been hugely helpful in that because it's meditation that I look forward to. And looking forward to doing something that's good for you is the secret to building that habit. And they do that in a couple of different ways. Firstly, they have a very broad approach. So whether you want guided meditations or whether you want open eye exercises or walking or running meditations or short breathing exercises, there's that and so much more there in the app. And secondly, I really like the tone and the language and the style of delivery. It really works for me. It, it, it makes me pay attention and be involved and engaged. If you want to try Headspace and you haven't before, now is the perfect time. Today, if you sign up with the link in the description down below, you can get a 60-day free trial and really explore everything the app has to offer and start to build a really great mindfulness habit. Thanks to Headspace for sponsoring this video. Okay, so let's talk about a different approach. I'm gonna take us back to a time before espresso and I'm gonna ask the question once again. So, who wants coffee? Let's talk about a different approach. Let's talk about infusion brewing. And to most people, that means the French press. A very popular kind of choice when it comes to brewing for a group, and frankly, an excellent choice. Infusion brewing is great because when you scale it up from making one cup to four cups to eight cups, everything kind of stays the same. The ratio stays the same, the grind setting can stay the same, the steep times stay the same. It's really, really easy to scale it up. It's also pretty cheap. This one here is listed as a 1.5 litre capacity, uh, but it was I think less than 20 pounds online and it works very well. Today, for eight people, I'm only gonna brew a litre. And I think about 120 mils of coffee per person after dinner is a very sensible amount. I don't think people want a lot of coffee. They want the experience of coffee. They want the digestive aid, though, Having had a look at the science, it seems coffee, while it does increase gastric secretion, does not speed up gastric emptying, and I too am sorry to hear that phrase said out loud. Anyway, coffee after a meal, it's a nice thing if you want it to be. I have made a big long video about the French press before, uh, but we'll cover the basics of the technique. In terms of recipe, I would recommend between 60 and 75 grams per litre. I will certainly be using about 60 grams of coffee per liter of water. In terms of grind setting, we wanna go for a medium grind setting. You'll see everyone recommending coarse grind settings for French press. I completely disagree. I think it tastes way better to go medium. We want fresh water, nice filtered water, uh, boiled onto the coffee. I'd say a normal kettle here is superior to a pouring kettle because we just wanna get the water on as quickly as possible and make sure all the grounds are nice and wet. We're gonna leave it to steep for about four minutes. And at the end of four minutes, we're gonna take a spoon and stir the crust that's formed. 30 seconds later, anything still floating around, we can just scoop that off, throw it away down the sink, into the food waste, wherever it needs to go. At this point, you can put the lid on, but don't press. The longer you can leave it without pressing, the less sediment you're gonna end up in the cups when you come to pour this. So the good news is, after not that long away from my friends, away from the table, I'm ready to go back. I won't do that. Instead, I'll tell you about another interesting infusion option, which is pretty new, which is the AeroPress XL. So here it is. It's much larger, more than twice the size, twice the capacity easily of the kind of conventional AeroPress. I've found it pretty easy to brew 500 mils of liquid at a time in this brewer. And that means brewing two batches, one after the other, wouldn't take all that long because again, just like the AeroPress, it's primarily an infusion brewer. It does have a percolation phase where you press through, but actually just scaling the recipe up, scaling the timing, scaling the grind setting up, works really pretty well. If you were really pushed for time, you could grind finer and try and do a double strength brew and then dilute it down with freshly boiled hot water so that with one single brew, you could brew a liter of coffee. But I would always prefer to do uh, a kind of good infusion brew with the right ratio of water to coffee. Overall though, it produces nice clean cup, it's pretty easy to use, and my ultimate AeroPress technique works pretty much uh, as you'd want with this brewer. Let's get this to the table. 
to say, I do love the French press. I think people have pretty low expectations for it, and that can actually work to your advantage. Most people have experienced French press coffee as being harsh, muddy, silty, not that much fun. Brewed right, it is crisp, clean, clear, vibrant, delicious, and sweet, uh, and it's probably the easiest way for anyone to get to incredibly delicious coffee. I think the hardest part of it is bringing it back to the table, knowing that it will benefit from sitting here for five more minutes, and being patient before everyone kind of stares at you too long, and you have to, gently begin to pour off some cups of coffee. Keep an eye on it as you pour, especially towards the bottom, to make sure you're not giving anyone any of that silt that we really, really don't want. Now, we do have one more method to cover, and we'll cover that now, and that's the method I'm calling the kind of large format pour of a brewer. Something new, and I think very interesting. We're back in the kitchen one last time, and we're gonna talk about a, a kind of new category of brewer, because we need to talk about pour overs, but pour overs historically were not particularly practical when it came to making coffee for a large group of people. You might make a cup or two in the morning for you and someone else, but the idea of making eight cups, that doesn't seem particularly real. You could, of course, go for a small batch brewer, but that's at least a couple of hundred dollars, and unless you're using that regularly, that's a lot of investment for an occasional coffee toy. But recently, we're starting to see some interesting, what I would call large format pour over brewers. And the first one I saw was this one here, from Etkin. It's porcelain, it's dual wall ceramic, which I think is rather lovely. It makes preheating it a little bit easier, and it's not incredibly heavy, which is also nice. It is a traditional kind of flatbed brewer. Uh, it's $55. Now, they do also make a carafe to go with it, which I think is a very good idea, because looking around the studio, I didn't have many liter capacity kind of carafes to bring with me. In fact, I had none, except for this one. So, well done, Etkin. When I first got my Etkin, I got a bunch of the Bun 8 cup to 12 cup filters. Uh, those work really well. Etkin do sell filters on their website, but there are options there. As I said, this brews, they say 8 cups, that's going to be a litre of coffee as a pour over. Now, something we don't usually do on this channel is talk about things that aren't yet available, but it seemed a shame not to include it because I gather it's coming very soon, and it's this. It's the big boy, a new large format pour over brewer from Araya. This, they say, can brew up to 80 grams of coffee, though I've been brewing 60 grams most of the time to a, a liter of water. The price is not yet confirmed at the time of filming this video, I expect something in the ballpark of around $35, but don't hold me to that just yet. Now, you can use a variety of filter papers in this. I have three different choices. You can use uh, a flat Sybarist filter for the fastest possible flow, uh, a standard flat filter, or a flatbed kind of wave filter as well. You've got the choices. For the two flat papers, you'd need this, which is the negotiator, which will cost extra. Obviously, papers are extra on top as well. When it comes to carafes, I didn't really have anything that this fit on, so I'm hoping that the rise of these brewers very quickly leads to a rise in carafes. I'll be improvising with something of about the right size when it comes to brewing with this. And before we brew with them, there's a couple of things I would need to think about when it comes to, to kind of building this into brewing coffee for a group. First thing is going to be your kettle. Now, most pouring kettles, especially most of the kind of uh, temperature-controlled ones, tend to be under a liter. I think Fellows is about 900. The Hario one that I often use, this one right here, is 800 mils. And trying to sort of brew 800 mils and then heat very quickly 200 mils to kind of finish the brew off, not ideal, not really what you want. You still want a nice pouring spout, but you need a bit more capacity if you're gonna go this way, which might need a brand new kettle for you, which is difficult. Secondly, this isn't to say that you couldn't just do two 30 gram pour overs with the existing setup that you have. It will take more time and you know one of them will be cooler than the other and you might want to blend them. Not ideal but not the worst, you can scale it up that way. But it is certainly an option. Again, if someone wants to do decaf then having a single cup uh, there would give you enough to split between two people. Because again, we're only trying to brew like 100, 120 mils of coffee per person. We're not trying to get people wired at that point in the evening. Both brewers are relatively tolerant. If you go a touch too fine, if your technique is good, you shouldn't have issues with channeling or anything like that. They'll just taste a little harsh, a little intense. They won't finish that well. If you get that, you're probably a touch fine. Go a little coarser. Finer, not always better. What I'll do now is brew with both of these brewers. Uh, we'll split me into two screens doing the same thing, and I'll talk you through some of the key aspects of technique that I found to be very useful as I brew. 
I'll also say that we've been talking about meditation today. It's funny the times you can find for a lovely moment of breathing. And I'll say a bloom on a pour over is a great time for even just 30 seconds of focused breathing. I think the next time you make a coffee, if you just try this, just try this, I think you'd be very pleasantly surprised by what great return you get on a little effort. So during my 45 second bloom, I'll have a chance to do just a little breathing. When it comes to blooming with these brewers, I would say make sure you use at least two grams per gram of coffee. Don't be afraid to use a little bit more. I would not recommend swirling excessively unless you have a very fancy grinder with a pretty minimal fines. When it's time to pour, my recommendation would be go for three larger pours rather than lots of little pours. This, for me, has produced better tasting coffee. Your mileage may vary. I need to go deep on these brewers at some point in the future, but this would be a great starting point. You get nice thermal stability across the brew, and what you're looking to do is basically fill the brewer pretty close to full each time and then let it drain back down again before filling again. The Edkin is a little easier in that regard because the brewer itself is bigger. The Araya, you need to let it drain just a little bit more if you're trying to do three pours of about, say, 280 grams to kind of match up to a pretty big bloom and hit a litre overall. You're generally pouring for four to maybe four and a half minutes with these brewers, and you might have then a minute of drawdown. That will vary a little bit depending on the paper that you're using and the grinder that you have, but I would say generally brews are under six minutes, but getting close to six minutes. I guess my only criticism of the large format brew is that you do feel like you're monotasking for five solid minutes, and that can be a bit frustrating. You don't really want to run away and do something else in between pours, even though you do have a bit of time, just because you could easily lose track of where you were. So the downside is you're gone for quite a long time, and you're very focused on something else for quite a long time. That aside, I have had some very delicious brews out of these, uh, and we've known big brews work well, batch brewers work well, there's no reason a large format pour over shouldn't work well, and indeed the coffee has been sweet, great clarity, very delicious. Let's get it to the table. There's one more thing we need to talk about. Brunch! If you're brewing for a brunch crowd, then there's a couple of things that you do want to think about maybe differently from dinner. Firstly, it's going to be people's appetite or need for coffee. It's going to be much bigger. You're going to need to brew at least twice as much coffee per person to have everyone be happy. You can totally brew one batch and pour it out and brew another batch and top people up. That's okay. But it is a really great opportunity to do a comparative tasting. Brew two different coffees maybe two different ways, and let people compare and contrast different coffees side by side because it's a lot of fun and it's a really great way for them to understand what they like and don't like about a cup of coffee. Secondly, this is different because you're going to serve coffee alongside food. They're going to have to match and marry up a little bit, and you want to think about certain things and worry about certain things, particularly eggs. Now, it's not just eggs, but egg yolks and very fatty foods like that really mess with your perception of coffee. They'll really mute the acidity of a cup and really transform fruity coffees into being kind of boring and less fun. So think about that if you want to serve something fine and fancy. Maybe keep it away from your smashed avo and poached eggs. One final note on choosing the coffee to serve. When it comes to those more fermented or natural processed coffees, I'd be really careful. When we did the world's largest coffee tasting, we saw that up to 40% of people in some cultures really had a very strong, kind of baked in aversion to those flavors. So you might love them, but no, serving them to a group is a big gamble. I would just pick something clean and sweet and delicious. It can be interesting and unusual. I would just wouldn't go the fermented flavor route. But now I want to hear from you. Do you regularly host people? Do you regularly make coffee for a big group? What didn't we cover? Do you have any additional tips or tricks that you want to share with us down in the comments below? I'd love to hear from you. But for now, I will say thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great day.